and we're so tired of the voices in our heads and the voices in our culture. We long to hear the voice of God. Generations come and generations go, but the word of the Lord stands forever. I would like to begin the lesson today by talking a little bit about magic. You remember when you were a kid and somebody would show up with that coin in their hand and they'd say, now, I want you to watch it very, very carefully and don't take your eye off it because if you do, it'll be gone. That'll be $2 on your way out. Thank you very much. Magic is one of those things that catches your eye and makes you full of wonder doesn't matter if you spent the rest of the day trying to recreate the trick or if your older brother told you how the trick was done. You remember being in that instant being caught in enchantment. Now, what if I told you that your father has written you a letter, a story, in fact, and he wants you to read that story with wonder and enchantment? I love the word wonder. Or wondrous. I looked this up, and wondrous means to experience a, an inspired feeling of delight. Think about when somebody express, expresses themselves as seeing something that is wondrous. It can range. It can range from something that's so pleasing that you want to hug your papa's neck. And it can also mean something where you feel so much awe, you are driven to fall to your knees. I mean, just follow along in Matthew chapter 15 and imagine being one of the onlookers. Jesus went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee, and he went up on the mountain and sat down there. And great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet, and he healed them, so that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speak the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they glorified the God of Israel. Nearly 300 years ago, Charles Wesley put some pen to paper, wrote these words down, and we've been singing them ever since. Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. Change from glory into glory till we, till with thee we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. I love that last line. Lost in wonder, love, and praise. I wish with all my heart that every believer could see the beauty of the Lord through the eyes of of a child, I think then you would know what it means to be lost in wonder. Several years ago, I was gifted with one of my most treasured possessions. It's a wardrobe. And I wish, uh, maybe I could just tell you the reason why I, I treasure it so much is because it was made in 1915. It was, and I do, but that's not the reason why I treasure it so much. I could tell you it's because I got it from the late, great Jimmy Allen. It was his own, and I love, every time I open it, remembering Jimmy Allen. And that's a great reason, but that's not the main reason why I treasure it. The main reason why I treasure the wardrobe is because Jimmy Allen's old wardrobe has now become Grace's portal to Narnia. I'll open wide those wooden doors, and she'll take her place in the transport room. And I'll wave goodbye as we close those doors. And she'll wave goodbye to Daddy. And after a few seconds, Grace will knock on the inside of the wardrobe door of the time travel machine. And when the doors fling open, behold, standing before her is not Daddy, oh no. For draped with a towel or bed sheet over my head and skipping with joy, Daddy's now Mr. Tumnus. I know that doesn't look like Mr. Tumnus, but work with me here. And Grace's eyes grow big and we dance and we sing and we just enjoy a whole new world together. 
And in the midst of it all is grace lost in wonder. I wish you could see, even better, I wish we all could experience what it looks like to be lost in wonder from a child's perspective. We did it once. A researcher walked into a kindergarten classroom, went up to the chalkboard and drew some squiggly lines and said, what do you see? Kindergarten. The answers she got back were enough to fill both sides of her piece of paper. Just imagine whenever you ask a kid what they see when they look up at the clouds. After filling out the piece of paper with all the things the children had seen, the same researcher went to a high school class down the hallway, drew the same squiggly lines, asked the same question, what do you see, and got two answers, squiggly lines, and nothing. I still remember the words of Milton Tucker, my undergrad biology teacher. At the end of a long lecture, he said, never lose your sense of wonder. When you open your Bible to read, what do you see? I think more often than not, we see what we're trained to see. These well-worn grooves with fully expected answers. A Sunday school class was once asked, what walks like a duck, talks like a duck, sings like a duck, and acts like a duck? And the little boy said, well, it sure sounds like a duck, but this is Sunday school class, so the answer must be Jesus. <laughs> How many times have we, have we sat for a lesson on the heroes of faith? Today, class, we're, we're going to study Hannah. What do we learn from Hannah? Oh, Hannah was humble. Hannah was obedient. Hannah was grateful. Go be like Hannah. Next week, we're going to look at Moses. Welcome to class. What do we learn from Moses? Oh, Moses was humble. Moses was obedient. Moses was gracious. Go, go be like Moses. I'm afraid to even talk about what we do the next week when Jesus is our subject. It's the same well-worn lines. And we see what we're trained to see. We see what we we're already planning to see, the, the rote script that we place upon every story. And we end up seeing the same four squiggly lines. But that's not how we read letters from the one that we love. And I wonder, if we got lost in wonder, we might just see what no one else sees. I have a good friend named J.L. Gerhardt. And Gerhardt has written a book called Look to Love. And in one of her chapters, she says, I want you to imagine what it was like for me. Because my favorite chapter in the Bible is 1 Samuel 21. If you go to 1 Samuel 21, you'll see that the story takes us to a place called Nod. It's a little hill city just north of where the tabernacle used to stand. And this is where the tabernacle now stands. David loved to go up to the house of the Lord. He speaks at all the times in the Psalms. But this was different. Just hours before, David had been in a field with his best friend in the whole world. They'd been making not just small talk, but they'd been talking about what to do since the king Saul had been plotting for David's death. And David scared Isolated and alone, runs to the only place that makes sense. Maybe Saul would expect him to run back home, so he runs to the presence of God. He enters into the tent. The priest is watching all this happen, and you know that David and the priest are friends, old friends. David realizes at this moment that him being there puts all the priests at risk. David, flustered, frustrated, scared, and nervous, makes up a story. Lies about why he's there. Also says he's hungry and needs some bread for his men. And the priest says, the only bread we have here is the consecrated bread. And David says, surely my men deserve that. And he takes the bread. There's a ruse going on. David knows it. The priest knows that David knows that he knows it. And there's more going on here than just words. 
Finally, David says, uh, one more thing. I'm on the king's mission. It's really important. And I've, I forgot a sword. You got one? And the priest says, well, we have one. It's back there behind the ephod wrapped up in a cloth. Why don't you go take a look? And David unwraps the cloth, and there is the sword that belonged to Goliath of Gath, David's old foe. He takes the sword. I can imagine them both giving that knowing nod as they leave. This may be the last time either sees each other alive, and that was true in one way. The next day, Saul sends his forces to rout and kill every priest in Nod, including David's old friend. Jennifer said she found out that her daughter had studied that story in Bible class that morning. She was so excited. On the way home, she said, tell me what you learned. And her daughter said, that is a bad story, Mom. She was heartbroken. She said, tell me what you mean. And her daughter looked at her and said, well, this was the moral of the story. Don't lie or people die. And Jennifer said, I, I gave her that look, that look that says I'm about to give you a lecture. And I did. I want to read this little bit from her book. The story in 1 Samuel 21 is a story about a God who loved a boy. A boy who'd become a man under his care. A man who, when he found himself scared and empty-handed, ran to the one he loved. The one his love, the one who loved him first. Our story starts with David on the run. He's in danger. Saul wants to kill him. He has no food, no money, no resources, no people. Where does he go? To God. David runs to the tabernacle, the holiest place on planet Earth. And he says in 1 Samuel 21, what he says many times, Lord, my God, I take refuge in you. Because he always has. So what do we learn about God from this moment in the life of David? Who is God according to this passage? God is a refuge. When we don't know where to run, when everything's going wrong, when it feels like we don't have a soul in the world on our side, we run to God. Keep going. David arrives at the tabernacle asking for bread, but there's no ordinary bread, just the bread of presence. Whose presence? God's. God is in the bread. The show bread or the bread of the presence, the consecrated bread, was displayed prominently on the table of show bread in the tabernacle. Each week, the priest would bake 12 loaves of bread and set them on the table uncovered all week. The next week, the priest would make 12 new loaves of bread to replace the old ones. The loaves wouldn't be thrown away at the end of their week-long presentations. Instead, they'd be eaten by the priests and their families. And it said that the bread, seven days old, tasted like new, freshly baked bread. Why leave the loaves of bread on the table, 12 loaves of bread precisely? As a lavish symbol of God's faithful provision, daily bread for each of his 12 tribes. This is the bread that David, God's anointed king, eats in the wilderness. It's manna. Who is God? He's our daily bread. And what about that sword? David, feeling afraid and sorely in need of protection, asks for a weapon. Surely he can't have expected much from the priest. It's also a comical request. Perhaps he thought a Levite had a sword, or maybe someone had left a sword on a recent trip. He must be stunned discovering Goliath's sword here of all places. As I read, it's the sword that does me in. Because the sword is so extra. God could have provided an ordinary sword for David, but just like he packed the bread with love and blessing. God speaks directly to David's heart with this luxurious reminder of his faithfulness. I love this next part. The sword is a romantic and sentimental gift. It's a memento kept by God in a cloth in his home. A souvenir of the time he and David killed a giant together because David trusted him enough to try. 
It's the matchbook from the restaurant where you and your husband went on your first date. It's the first baseball you and your son threw in the backyard. It's the label from the bottle of sparkling grape juice that you used to toast your daughter's baptism. This sword represents David's favorite memory with God and God's favorite memory with David. A memory God never wanted David to forget every time. No matter how many times I read it, when David says the line, there is no sword like it, I weep. Who is God? He's the kind of God who keeps our Little League trophies behind the ephod. Don't tell me that doesn't make you fall in love. You know, the Bible is a love letter. Oh, I know it's more than that. Let's not forget it's more than that. But it is no less than that. God is speaking to a people that he's created in his image, that he's made to be like him, to be co-creators in the world. And one of the things God does well that he wants us to do is he tells fantastic stories. And he teaches us to live out those stories in such a way that when people tell of the tales of God at work in us, it'll be a story of love. Think about the first letter that you ever got from the one whom your heart adores. How did you read it? What questions were you asking when you read that first letter from the one who makes your heart go pitter-patter? Oh, I know what you were asking. How is any of this useful in my daily life? What are the main points so I can gather them together to figure out the main argument being presented? Why should I trust anything in this letter? Those weren't the questions. The questions we were asking, who is this person? How do I know them deeper and better because of what they're saying? How do I get lost in wonder and love as a result of what I'm reading? It's not a dictionary. It's not a history book. It's the beginning of a relationship. What if we began to see the Bible as a message of love from a holy God who wants us to get to know him in every single story? Think how much the Bible focuses on the heart of a person. How often God says, I care about what's going on in your heart. And then when his son Jesus tells us the two greatest commandments, the greatest rules of the law, both rules are the rules of love. Love God with everything you've got, including your heart. And it will spill out into how you love your neighbor. Why do so many people not read the Bible? Why do so, pe so many people read the Bible and not enjoy reading the Bible? Why do so many of us begin January 1 with a daily Bible reading plan that lasts for about four days? The answer is because we think we're doing homework. We don't think we're reading a letter of love from one our heart adores sent from a foreign field. What if we ask new questions? Where is God in this story? What's he up to? What's he like? How do I love him more? How can I sense his relentless love in this story? In other words, ask the question that you ask when you're seeking to fall in love. What if I told you the Bible was meant to be enjoyed? Oh, there are all kinds of metaphors in Scripture for the message and the story of God. Isaiah 25 talks about a grand feast that's laid out for us. So great, we can't get enough. And that language about what we're going to expect in that future day of eating and drinking with God himself gets used to refer to the word, the message of God in the Psalms. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I wonder how many of us like to read poetry. In fact, if I were to ask you to be honest, 
How many of you have read a poetry book in the last year? Do you know what the survey says? 6%. 93% of us don't pick up and read a poetry book, and the Bible's chalked full of it. What if the Bible was meant to be enjoyed? What if we're asking questions that aren't bad, they're just incomplete? What if we're asking questions that you would ask if you were to interrogate a prisoner, but not the questions we ask when we're falling in love? What would it look like if we were lost in wonder and love and praise? I will always be grateful to Tom Albright. Many of you know Owen Albright, Owen's older brother, Tom, wrote a little book on trying to teach us on how to read the Bible. And there was one quote that I will never forget. He said, over my years of reading this book, I've come to recognize one thing. The Bible is not written so much to answer my questions as it's written to question me. I go to the Bible expecting to find answers to what I bring to it. But I come away changed by what God has brought to it. It changes my questions. What would it look like to read the whole Bible? The whole Bible, lost in wonder, love, and praise. When I read Genesis 1, I've been taught to ask these questions. What happens on day one? What happens on day two? How long were these days? Are these days sequential? Are they 24 hours? Are they 23 hours? How many hours were there in days one through three before the sun shows up? What happens on day five exactly? Would you lay it out for me linearly? What would I have seen if I had a video camera? Would it be like a time-lapse video of something happening very fast? What happens on day seven when he rests? How come it doesn't say morning or evening? Is this something different than the other literary days? I'm asked to ask these questions, but what if we read it, not just with those questions, but with a different set of questions in mind? What is God doing? You know what he's doing? He is bringing order out of chaos in the most beautiful way possible. Did you see the colors when you read Genesis 1? He makes the sky so blue and the water so blue. And my grace knows that on one day, God made the sky and seas so blue. And all I remember thinking is, he made the skies and seas. You know what grace taught me? He made them blue. God loves colors. The text doesn't just say that there was animals created. It says, let the land swarm. It doesn't just say he made fish It says, let the water teem. He loves wonder. I just see God making the waters, making the animals, and with the wave of the wand, the abracadabra, look at how over the top I can be in the beauty and wonder of it all. And then apply it to your life because he says at the end of every day, this is good. It's time for you to go wash your dishes. It's time for you to tell your husband to go wash the dishes. It's time for the husband to remember he promised he'd wash the dishes. And you're looking at the dishes and you're thinking, these don't smell good. This is not fun. I'd rather be watching the game. This is a waste. It's a chore. I guess it's a have to. I guess it's homework. We could do that. Or we could think, you know what this is? Have you ever seen Beauty and the Beast? Do you know what's happening here? We are preparing for a feast you'll never forget. Be our guest. And every time we wash a dish, we think to ourselves, I am taking all the dirt and the grime off of this, and I am making something beautiful, fit for a king, because we're going to have a feast like we've never had before. We take all the ugliness and we bring beauty into it. And we let the water fall and we let the soap bubbles float. And we remember our children who just love the sight of bubbles. And we let the bubbles team up top and we blow them up the top of our hands. And we bask in the joy that God didn't have to make chores this fun. 
My wife is listening to me say this and saying, I've never seen you this excited when you wash the dishes. <laughs> we take those dishes, we put them in the bin, we watch them dry, and then we say, this is good. I just, in a very small way, became a co-creator with God. And I see the wonder of it all. Okay, you can do that with Genesis 1 because that's an exciting passage. But talk about the one where Nadab and Abihu die. Find wonder, love, and praise in that. Well, all right, I'm up for the challenge. The first four verses, Nadab and Abihu, these are the children of Aaron, the oldest two sons of his four boys. And the text says it was time to offer the sacrifice. And they offered strange fire to the Lord. Leviticus 10, 1 through 4. Here are the questions we're taught to ask. What's the strange fire? Text doesn't say. So some commentaries say maybe they offered at the wrong time. Some say maybe they offered wearing the wrong clothes. Maybe they offered with other people that weren't priests in the wrong way. Maybe they grabbed fire off of a different altar than the one they were supposed to get. The text doesn't say. And then we tell our children, here's the point of Leviticus 10. If you slip, somebody dies. I am convinced that the holiness of the Lord is a major theme throughout the whole of Scripture. I don't think it's a coincidence that you find language in the New Testament which will help bring out, if this is one of your points, the importance of holiness to the Lord. You could even grab a second point. Let me add to that argument. You could say, of all the people who get struck down, it's the ones who are representing God to the people. The closer you get to God, the greater the responsibility. That's a New Testament teaching, right? Doesn't James tell us that don't be many teachers? you receive greater judgment. I get all of that, and that might be right there in verses 1 through 4, but that's not all there is. These are Aaron's sons. Aaron and these boys walked up the mountain when Moses got the revelation from the Lord. This is no small thing. And if somebody had to die, God knows that that story continues and can go in so many tragic ways. And so, God speaks directly to Aaron. This is the only time in Scripture where God does that. He's always spoken to Moses. He says, Aaron, you're still my guy. There's still work to be done. There's still work for you. These are my people. And I can't help but think that behind this, there's more going on than words. God knows what Aaron knows, and Aaron knows what God knows, and God knows Aaron knows what God knows, that he's experiencing the worst experience of his life. And there's still work to do. How do you go on serving people when your only son has been slaughtered? Keep that thought. At the end of the chapter, there's still work to be done. There's cousins, there's other kids, and they are still offering sacrifices, and they do it wrong. We know how this story's supposed to end, right? God, the God who only has one basic moral point, if you slip, you're going to die. He's going to slaughter them all, right? That's not what happens. They do it wrong. And the text says, that Moses is furious, and he goes to Aaron. He says, how could you have not done this right? Look what just happened when we did this wrong. You do it wrong again, what do you think is going to happen? And Aaron says basically this. It's a very cryptic verse. But he says basically this. They've offered a sin offering. They offered grain offering. They've offered two offerings. So have I. Two slaughters. Offered to God? What do you think I've just been through? You think God would be pleased if I ate that sacrifice in the mess I'm in? Don't you think God understands what's going on right now? And Moses says, I think he does. 
There is nothing in this story that says you should be flippant before a holy God. There is nothing in this story that says God could care less about his rules. You know what it says? There's a real relationship going on. This is not an automaton. This is not a book that we follow. This is a relationship with a real God who says, I know what it's like to go through what you're going through. Just watch. Because when you get to the New Testament, you're going to have the death of God's own son slaughtered, and there's still work to be done. And that work frees the very people who have hurt God's own heart. And I think there's a symbol of this. Because Nadab and Abihu don't get mentioned again until chapter 16, verse 1. There's a whole new chapter, and the first verse says, Moses spoke to Aaron. You know who I'm talking about? Aaron, the one who lost his two oldest boys. And what do you think that introduces? It introduces the Day of Atonement. That out of death and tragedy comes the most beautiful story that affects everyone on earth. I want you to know that you can read every text of the Bible and end by seeing nothing more than a love story from a God who wants more than anything to be one with us. A God who never asks more from us than we could possibly ask of ourselves and a God who says, don't you know, I want to be with you. I love the song, be careful little hands what you do. I love be careful little eyes what you see. That's right. Keep teaching it to my kids. But if that's all you see, you're missing out on the beauty of it all. Because God's message to you in Christ is not no, no, no. His message to you in Christ is yes. So in addition to being very careful about what you do, may I suggest that we should be filled with wonder. Go explore. Be filled with wonder, kids. Go explore. For your Father up above made this whole world in love. So be filled with wonder, kids. Thank you for joining us. I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've been enriched. And if you have any questions, any thoughts, any comments, reach out to us at prayers at wschurch.net. God bless you. Tune in next week.